Don't worry, guys. I got editing, so we can be a little choppy here in the first minute to get our grounding. We can start with the bottom of page two. I'm not sure if that's where you left off. Bend their reality. Or, did, or should we start off with calibrated questions? Let's let's go for the bend the reality. I think it's it's a cool thing to to bring to light. Um, and well, so right. so what is what is known as accusation of it is an extremely powerful tool. It's like um, as close to Jedi powers as you could possibly get to. Uh, so anchoring the emotions, right, to to um, to prepare them for the blow or to disarm the, um, the, the the dynamic, right, to putting it on the on the conscious level and whatever we bring to light, it kind of dissipates, right. So it's important to bring emotional dynamic to the light. Or if we're talking about price, for example, right, you you kind of preparing them for the shock, if the price could be shocking by uh, putting an accusation on it and yeah like Daniel can you uh, maybe share with us some of the accusation orders that you found to be useful in those in those scenarios uh, you're, you're probably gonna think I enjoy hearing my voice and probably think I'm just trying to hog up the mic here. Heck, you might even say, can this guy negotiate his way out of a wet paper bag? You probably feel a little bit of so, butterflies in your tummy right now. Yeah, there it is. Boom. The key to boom. the accusation audit, it's that pause to let it sit with your counterpart. Uh, we notice in mocks, anybody that there's a label accusation on it. It's almost instantaneously they talk over it, run over it, put up because instead of just letting it sit there. Yeah. And and when when it comes to like price, right? It's it's always a good idea to let the other party go first to get the price out, right? Um, especially if you're not sure like what would be the real value of, of the matter here. So it's good to hear the price first because that gives you more ammunition to go off on. Um, and you know, at, at that point you could you could do a few things. You could establish a range, right? So let's say if um, let's say if it's a salary, right? And someone said, well, you're gonna get like 50k, uh, 50k, this this is the, the salary here. And you could do it with the range. Well, I heard that in similar, you know, in, in, in the similar jobs to your competitors, the, the, the salary range would be from 40 to 80K, right? So that, that will allow you a, um, that creates a range, creates a, creates a space for you to negotiate a better package, better price. And if, if the, the negotiation is stale, number four, what you could do is pivot to non-monetary terms. So give things that are not important. If you're talking about negotiation, if you're not talking maybe about the salary per se, but uh, negotiating a certain terms. Um, Douglas, maybe you could, you could chime in a little bit and, and tell us your perspective about the range and non-monetary terms, like how do you, how do you approach this? How do you see? It? How are you seeing it? I actually could not agree more on non-monetary term type stuff. I mean, there might be something that they they absolutely would just make them crazy happy. That like in terms of closing or a specific thing you're trying to accomplish uh, in their in their close that might not have anything whatsoever to do with monetary terms. So it, you know, going back to the black swan type type thing that if you uncover something great like that that's a great great point um in terms of something you can throw in i mean it means nothing to you but if you discover something that really matters a lot to them talk about an easy win i think the most famous one i've heard of is from patrick bet david you ever heard of uh value Tamen on youtube well he he's real big uh 
and he had a cool story where a wealthy guy, nothing was working, and eventually asked him, what do you need other than monetary? Because the guy had a bunch of money. He goes, I really need someone to visit my son in prison. No one visits him. And he did. He would go and see him like once every other week. And the guy said, here's my Rolodex. Feel free to call anybody of my friends. Tell them I sent you. And he just took off. And number five, use odd numbers. Don't use round numbers. 199. 999. Number six, surprise with a gift. Generate reciprocity by giving unrelated surprise gifts. Um, there is one type of negotiator that does not like gifts, and that's the assertive. Uh, landlord once gave my wife and I a gift. She got so excited. She's like, oh, wow, such nice people. And I'm there going like, what do you, what do you mean? They're going to raise the rent. That's why buttering us up before they do that. And I want to go back to number one. I mean, number two, let the other party suggest a price first. I think that one's the most important one. Um, that's like, hold off on your ask. Don't talk. Let them suggest. And it, it takes a lot of resilience. And they'll always try to get you to say the price first. and Always deflect. Deflect or put it back on their court. Yeah, but that's a yeah, that's a that's a crucial one. Number two. Uh, Freddie, yeah, and you can you can actually go ahead, Freddie. Yes, with number two, I found it difficult to deflect sometimes because they it depends what you do. Is people want to have some idea what they're dealing with. Uh, that's, uh, that's the one that I have the most challenge because usually I try to accommodate, try to deflect, but it, it, sometimes people, you know, go to the point of so, so how much are we talking about just to have uh, an idea. What is the best way for you guys to answer without answering much? Well, if you got to, eventually you have to, then you go to number three, you give a range. Don't give them the exact number. Give them a range. And they'll always select the top of the range for some reason. It's greed. Uh, Eugene, you got something to add? Yeah, you could, you could use a couple of labels. So you could say, it sounds like you have a price in mind. Yeah. Or you could say, you know, I can see you have, um, you can give it good consideration and there is a, a price on top of your mind. So let, let them respond. You will see, like, if there is the hesitation, you know, maybe they're not ready to reveal the price, uh, you know, and then you can do the accusation audit, right? Um, so the labels are very powerful. That's how you draw out the, the, the information. Mislabels. Yeah, or mislabels. Vision. You could say, I heard, I mean, from the competition, I might be, you know, I might be completely off track here. You know, the, the, in this situation, the price normally is yada, yada, yada. Oh, no, that's outrageous. Okay, well, it sounds like you have a price in mind. Yeah, remember, when you're just talking, when you're just talking numbers, and that's when it's really key for number four to pivot to non-monetary value. That's way better than giving them. And if you're going to have to give them a number, give them an odd number. And maybe a little gif. Yeah, that's, that's how you know you're dealing with a, with a shark is when they're trying to get that price out of you first. Now you got to be like, oh, wait, I'm dealing with a shark here. Yeah, you better get on, always be on your top game, especially where a shark will eat like a piranha. They'll just eat you to the bone if you let them. Yeah. And let's go to ready for calibrated questions. Would you be opposed to working on calibrated questions? That's a no-oriented calibrated question, right? Um, 
Yeah, so if you go, go you know, point by point, the listener has control of the conversation. This is really, really hard to grasp, really hard, especially for the beginners. They think that I'm talking right now, so I have the conversation. But because I'm talking, I'm letting go of the control. Like, you know, you guys are observing how I'm saying, what I'm saying, where is it all leading, you know, so the listener have the control. It's not the, the, the one who speaks. You know what? When, so uh, you know, and, and this. So when Douglas asked that question, that calibrated question, did you guys hear how I responded? I didn't. Just stayed quiet, and then Eugene jumped on. Yeah, yeah. dynamic silence. I, it's so underrated. It truly is the ultimate superpower because if you're in dynamic silence. It means you're in listener mode. That means you're actually in control. Beginning to know that I've noticed that a lot when doing labeling uh, lately. It, it, when you pair it with dynamic silence, it gives you a real opportunity to just again. And it's not my nature. I love to you know put my ideas out there, but boy, I tell you what, there's so much power in just shutting up and and listening and using that silence. And that it, it's been kind of mind-boggling to see what how different conversations go with that the way i look at it, when i'm in dynamic silence I, I picture my counterpart just burying their grave i mean digging their grave every time they talk yeah and then lay them in there with that summary and you rest in peace with the summary <laughs> so uh, it became dark very quick. <laughs> oh, I like it. Oh, I like it. Darth Vader has entered the chat. Oh, I like it. Nice and dark in here. So, uh, bullet point number two, Freddie, can you read that to us? Sure. Goal is to suspend unbelief, calibrate the questions to ask for help. So what I understand is in some ways you have to let your counterpart to uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> let me read again. I, I didn't I didn't no, think I get one. it. No. I think in some ways you have to drop your assumptions and just ask the questions. That's what I understand. Yeah, because uh, some of these calibrated questions, uh, they lead to the black swan, if it's right. I mean, you got to suspend your unbelief that they're not going to tell you anything you haven't heard. Uh, I think the, the problem is that I, I, I see sometimes is when, when people ask questions, they sort of ask in a way that they leading demanding demanding for answers yeah or they ask you a leading question mm -hmm. and, I, and i feel uh, in my case i feel like when i ask questions sounds like natural or like sounds like i'm not as fishing for information um try to make a natural conversation but i i notice with other people it's very it could be very intense when someone asks you questions yeah. Just this calibrated question, it's not the first thing you do. I mean, I mean, you're asking those heavy calibrated questions when you already have rapport. Yeah. And you have to be careful, like, if the questions are too far from each other in terms of, like, how you're asking, how you're asking it, it's going to create this gap and it will create this weird sensation. Like, are you, uh, what are you, are you interrogating me? Like, what is it, what's the purpose of this? What's the intention of those questions? Um, I always catch myself saying, I'm just curious before that's how you know the report's not really there. If you guys say, oh, Hey, yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, but once you, yeah. once you don't say that, you know, you're in report. Curious or help me understand. Like, I, I really want to understand some things you could, you could use depending on report and situation. Um, 
But a suspend that belief, I mean, no oriented questions are really powerful here. And it's shocking to what people say no to. You know, that's what Chris Voss preaches. And depending on the question or the situation, you know, this is, this is how, I guess this is how I understand, goes to suspend unbelief. This is a little bit of a blur for me, but I guess like if you're coming, would it would be a ridiculous idea to do X, Y, Z. So that makes the cogwheels turn. I think like, that's, that's not a ridiculous idea. And then once they say no, they start thinking about the, uh, what are you asking them? So you kill kind of two rabbits with one bullet. They say no, they feel safe. And then they suspend their unbelief and started thinking about possibly solving this equation for you. Yeah, and bullet point. I mean, that's like Jeremy Miner, NEPQ sales right there. The calibrated question for help. Help me figure out your pain. So bullet point number three. All right, so I love scissors. I like running with them. Don't use can, is, are, do, does. Yeah, cut those out. So calibrated question, I guess uh, with an is, are, hey, um, are you tired of failing? <laughs> Probably uh, hear that a lot. Are you tired of being fat and tired? It's like every weight loss commercial. But I like the ones that are like, what would your life be if you had 20 pounds less? No, oh, I, hey, that'd be great. I can, I can finally wear that shirt. Yeah, it's, it's very odd. Like, uh, there's a lot like the word, but really can't use that unless you want to erase something prior. What do you guys think about a calibrated question with can, is, are, do, and does? I use in the past to confirm cer certain information that I have. Um, I, I, I would say something like if I, if I feel like the person is not feeling with what, what we're going to do, do you really want to do that? Just to confirm if the person wants to, really do or not, at least that's what I use in the past. My, my impression of it is it, it's much more, um, it feels loose, loosey goosey, not, not as confident is kind of how I'm, I'm taking those. Uh, whereas how would you like to proceed is much more direct and, and to me, you know, can we proceed as more, you know, kind of tentative? So that's kind of how I'm perceiving that. That's the first time I recall ever seeing those, but that that's a great point. I, I do know Jerry Miner uses them. I know he says, uh, is, is, is that timeline something you're okay with? No, I mean, I'd rather make that money now than later. Okay, and, and what, what would that do for you? All right. Um, I catch him saying it. The thing is, his tone is so, it just sounds so harmless. Right. So, yeah, I think you can use those is, does, but man, your tone has to be in a special modality. Really has to be like an ultra curious, have no harm. I'm just literally curious. Let's go to. Yeah, it, it really depends on the context. Yeah. Like normally people are like, can you, can you help me with this? And again, depending on your, on your voice, uh, you know, voice delivery is everything. But in this case, you could practice by replacing can with no oriented question other than, you know, kind of wanting to hear yes, addicting, addicted, being addicted to hearing yes, start getting addicted to hearing no, because no is really powerful and people are afraid of hearing no. So hear it, right? So would it be a terrible idea 
to ask you to lend the help, like to lend the hand. No, that's not a, that's not a bad idea. And now they start thinking whether that's something that they could help you with, right? So you make them think. Uh, but the, when you ask, like, can you help me with this? Uh, no, nah, so many things going on. Yeah, there was that uh, tone. Nah, that's, can you help me with this? Do I yeah. have to? Rock, do you wanna do you wanna go to this to this party? Uh, no, I don't wanna. I don't wanna go to this party. But if you ask, like, hey, is this um is this a horrible idea to you know to join us at the party? Here's the worst. No, one. I mean it's not horrible. Hey, are are you off to are are you off work this Saturday? Uh, yeah, man. Why? Hey, can you help yeah. me move? <laughs> oh. Uh, are you going up north tomorrow? Uh, wow. Well, you need a ride. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, it's very hard to ask the no questions. Uh, I watched a guy on YouTube whose goal was to get 50 no's in one day. And it was so tough to watch. And I'm like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't hear no. That was the one that took me the longest to implement. And it was the most impactful one, funny enough. So, uh, Douglas, can you read point number four, avoid? Sure thing. Avoid questions that be, can, can be answered with yes or tiny pieces of information. It's good to go deep and dark. It's really hard to answer that with yes. Yeah, I mean, the yes oriented question again, like you, you understand what no is, and no is a safety. It's, it's you know, you, you, you just said no to something. And this becomes very obvious when you start having kids. At a certain age, they're starting saying no because it feels good. Like it's, it's just no, I'm not going to do this, daddy. Like, no, no, no. So like, it's, it's a part of the nature, it's, it's autonomy. That's what, you've, that's what they practice, autonomy. I don't want that, I don't want this, refusal. Um, so use it, use it. It's, it's, it's ingrained in our systems to say no since very early childhood. That's why saying no is really powerful because now that they say no, they already feel better about this. And now they can start thinking, you know, what and how and why, which is the next point. Yeah, next point. Start every question with what, how, and sometimes, but rarely, why. Only use why when defensiveness it creates. Only use why when, def when defensiveness it creates is in my favor. Why would you ever change from the way you're always done things and try my approach? Can't leave. What do you hope to achieve by going? Avoid angry emotional reactions. Yeah, Ed, so I think those are point two. Look, um, you're probably going to trigger your counterpart, and that's okay if you trigger them. Just make sure you don't get triggered. That's the, that's the big difference. And that's tough when you're emotionally involved. Well, this what and how is it's really great practice to start doing this, what and how and avoid why. You know, if you just start practicing negotiations, but why is tremendously powerful. And that's why, you know, Black Swan Group and, and other negotiation negotiators are asking you to avoid this. When there is any decision, like if you hear a decision, if you ask why, you're going to have a better perspective and understanding where they're coming from because they're going to feel the need to defend their decision-making process. And if you're talking about conflict resolution, that's not going to be very, uh, very useful sometimes. But if you're talking about the genuine conversation, like you can ask why, and it's very powerful because it is not only um, you asking the question, but it's the person actually justifying to themselves why they made this decision. And that helped them realize a lot of, a lot of things that not at the conscious level when you when you're engaging in conversation. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah, looks good. Oh, okay, much better. Be able to flow faster. That's what I meant to do on page one and two. We might have to go redo those. No biggie. Uh, where are we at? 
Yeah, and another one that uh, Dan and I were talking about when we we're in the context of Socratic selling, we were watching a video on that you sent over. Eugene, thank you for that, by the way. Um, there's a fantastic uh, combination between uh, mirror. It's the, the stuff that set, uh, behind mirroring, there's a kind of a combination mirror and uh, calibrated question called criteria elicitation. So basically, um, and I can just show you, show you real quick what it looks like. Dan, what's most important to you about your uh, podcast here? Spreading the joy of negotiations. Uh, spreading the joy of negotiations. And Dan, what's most important to you about spreading the joy of negotiations? All right, I think, uh, I think there's too many people walking around with unnecessary stress. And eventually it might get to me. So if I can get others to control their stress, hey, they won't come on stressing me. And, and Dan, if you don't mind me asking, what's most important to you about helping others control their stress? I mean, I just said it, man. That way it won't it won't come on over to me. You know, I'm not trying to deal with other stress. You know, teach a man to fish, they'll eat for a day. I'm sorry, give a man a fish, they'll eat for a day. Teach him a fish to eat forever. Yeah, teach them negotiations. They'll be able to forever handle all their stress and not bug you. Yeah, and, and if you notice the process there, what it does for you by using their own language in addition to the calibrated question, mar mar uh, marrying the two together, we got pretty deep into you know what's really driving Dan and his negotiation practice and doing the podcast. You get a real strong sense of you know why is he doing this and what's important to him, and I think that's really useful stuff if you're trying to uh, understand what's driving his his outcomes. And the other things you could do is why question, for example, just an illustration. So then what, what made you uh, what made you start a, a podcast? And I, I seen other dumb people do it. I'm like, if that dumbass can do it, <laughs> sure I can do it. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Why, why is that important to you now though? You know, uh, it's only a matter of time till the AI machine wakes up and it needs to know that. I'm here for good, goodness sake, spare me, machine. So again, did, why is it really, it, 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 the, how, you, how you ask it? Like you could ask it. Yeah, your, tone was, you know, your tone was good. Yeah. Here, I, I'll, I'll try it. I'll try it. Hey, Eugene, why, why do you got that, that thing behind you? Bunch of small pictures. It sounds like you, I'm being judged right now. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I, I, sounds I, like you're throwing me under the bus, Dan. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, that that really. Uh, man, I think the worst why I got when I was just talking to Jen was uh, a boss pulled me into the office and he goes like, "Why are you making decisions on your own? Like uh, I'm an independent contractor. I'm independent." <laughs> He's like, no, I'm the boss here. And I make the rules. And I'm like, why did you even ask me that? <laughs> yeah, right. Why did you even ask me if you got an answer? A lot of times the whys, they already have like their answer. And so, yeah, like what Eugene did, he deflected back. He's like, well, why are you asking me that? It seems like you're judging, bro. Oh, dang. I didn't even notice I was judging. Yeah, my fault. I don't know what got into me. Boy, and that, that's a great point of how def how you could use labeling defensively there to, to start de-escalating someone coming at you with the why question. Maybe the why produces reaction mostly. Like if someone is attacking you, why is a, is a, is a is the word as attack word is like a spear that they're throwing at you. Mm -hmm. And you gotta have to, you gotta understand what's the intention behind it. Like, wh why are you asking me this? But you cannot say, why are you asking me this? That becomes a combat, right? You're becoming, that's a conflict. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I broke off a, a good friendship because of a why question not long mm. ago. Hey, uh, why do you got negotiator on your LinkedIn for? Why not? <laughs> do what I want. What do yeah. you, what's, your, what's your deal with it? <laughs> yeah. No, it, it is. It's very uh, 
doesn't connect, it disconnects for sure. Yeah, yeah unless you ask it for it to favor you. What are we on? Phrases to use. What makes you ask? Yeah, we just talked about that. What makes you ask about my my pictures? What about blank is important to you? How can I help this make better for us? How would you like me to proceed? What is it that brought us into this situation? That's how can we solve the problem? What's the objective? What are we trying to accomplish here? And how am I supposed to do that? You guys got any favorites from there? I, I know I do. The, what, what is it that brought us into the situation? I always, I like a variation of it. Like, how did we get to this situation? 60 seconds or she died. How, yeah. how did you end up here today? You guys got any favorites, Eugene? I like that. How would you like to like me like to proceed or some variation thereof? I think that gives a lot of detail on what their implementation timeline looks like, and I really like that. Yeah. I mean, what, what about this is important to you? Uh, I mean, if you just you just did this with why, like why why studying a podcast is important to you now, though, right? That that's why you can again just kind of kind of why you can dissolve the the force of why by saying though why so important now though right and what what about this that makes it important to you or for you um that that, that is actually a really good question um what makes it important to us if if you're coming back to scenario like ah you just seems like you have some silly squares behind you the square picture you know what's the importance of of asking me that I like circle pictures. Yeah. You just hate square pictures. That's absolutely fine. We still can be brothers. <laughs> Such a square. Question, question. Oh, by the way, I like the, the, the one while we trying to, oh, usually, I usually ask, what's, oh, what's the agenda for today? What's the objective? Mm. Especially when I talk to people a lot. I should use that for, for every, every meeting. What's the purpose of me here? I, I've yeah. been doing that. Uh, what, what's needed for me in this meeting? Uh, nothing, just to listen. Oh, well, <laughs> just send me the notes. Please. I'm just going to listen. <laughs> just send me the notes. I don't, I don't like attending meetings where I'm not yeah. a force of can, nature. Can you guys provide me a example when you use why, when defensiveness is creating you in your favor. Yeah, uh, Freddie, why did you choose to jump on here tonight? Okay, I, I see. I see what you're trying to do there, but that's uh, that's assuming that you sort of know that I'm already here. So just what if the you... question? I mean, wh oh. What was I trying to do? Like, yeah, what is what was I trying to do? What... So I'm already here. So of course, there's a there is an answer for that question. But if I wasn't, I just ask uh, asking you, hey, what's going on tonight? How can you use the why for? It's a very specific. It's a value proposition, and so like. The way I'm asking it right now, like, yeah, just answer it. Like, well, why did you jump on this Zoom call tonight? I feel like uh, reviewing this uh, this page. I, I, I feel like it would be a very productive day if I review with you guys. All right. And okay, now but why, though? Yeah, yeah, why? Why, though, no, Freddie? Because I was plan, I was uh, I was planning to take time to review it. Um, I, actually, I was planning to read some chapters, but I didn't find time. So the email sort of like forced me to. Okay. Do you feel Do you feel defensive explaining the reasons? No. No, well, you feel because... good explaining it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah if, if... 
No, I mean, like, it, it really depends if it's a decision and I'm curious about your decision, right? And she said, but why though? You can, you can ask it, so what, what, makes you, um, what makes you come here today? It, it really is about delivery. Like, that's why you have to avoid why, because why is a loaded, it, it's, it's, it produces defensive response if you're not sure how to use it. But you can have very disarming voice and if it's a decision you want to understand, not the question, but a decision you want to understand, what's behind your desire to come to, the, uh, you know, to this podcast today or show? Why is that important to you? I know what he wants to say. Like it's really, it's really is about its own and delivery and, and the intent. That's the, 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 what's the intent? Now, you know that if you ask what and how questions, I think why is stronger, especially when it's, uh, when it's a decision, when it's involved decision. Uh, what and how produces slightly different result. It's about kind of implementation, but why is, is getting the rationale behind the decision making process? I know why he's here. Is we're Jedi negotiation. We must be a Jedi in negotiations. Yes. But why though? <laughs> I got a I wife to negotiate. He said that's right. His face says that's right. Let's go on to the how. And this is, uh, I was just talking about this. About the uh, Freddie, about the rule of three. I was just talking to him before you guys ruined the show. Is yes, is nothing without how. Um, number two, calibrated how. Questions help guarantee execution. Look for that's right. Don't settle for I'll try. You're right. Those means I plan to fail. Phrases to use. How am I supposed to do that? How will we know we're on track? How will we address things if we find we're off track? Influence those behind the table. How does this affect the rest of your team? How on board are the people not on this call? What do your colleagues see as their main challenges in this area? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about yes, it's nothing without how, this is really important. And people are, it's really hard to grasp, you know, people like, because you're, most of the time people are addicted to yes. So when they hear, yeah, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, yeah you're right, I can yeah, do I'll this. Do it. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, sure, I mean, no problem. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, I mean, depending on the tone of voice, again, what you're hearing is it's not exactly, um, you know, obvious, but uh, that's why it's important to, um, to ask those calibrated questions to understand the how. I was like, what's going to happen if, uh, if you know, we fail with this project? Where, 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 does, where would that put us if we, um, you know, if we, if we fail to, to implement the solution? How would that affect our relationship if we, um, if we won't be able to solve this thing? Right, so you, you gotta understand the how and what's going to happen if they're not going to implement this. So this is a very powerful question to ask. And it, it's very easy because once you arm yourself with those kind of little, little questions, right? And you're able to probe and clarify whatever you're hearing, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of black swans coming. And bad black swans too. Um, there was one Chris Voss video I remember watching where the one of the black swans was essentially that the board or whatnot did not really have a plan for her role. But they had a lot of expectations and she asked calibrated questions and it was not looking favorable for her. So she uh, consulted Chris Voss, which he's, which I like this running military. He told her, go ask, go tell them, do you, I get the sense you want me to fail. Or I get the sense you're setting me up for failure. And she went back in there and delivered that. And all of a sudden, she got more detail. She got budget. She got everything she needed to succeed. So yeah, the calibrated questions, the hows, it really can shine a light on the deficiencies. Um, 
One big one I heard today is when you get a job, yeah, you should ask in a way, in a tactful way, what happened to the last person you're replacing? Why did they quit? Did they have any issues or were they promoted? And if they're promoted, that's probably a good company. If they were fired or they quit, yeah, you might want to ask some how questions. Well, how did that happen? How do they mess it up? Is there issues with my audio or is it me? Yeah, it does sound like there's a hum in the background. Oh, is it? There you go. Yeah, you're good. That was weird. Well, let's let's hit a rewind. No, let's continue. And any thoughts so far? Yeah, for, for that's right. I mean, what, what are the sum of the variation to that's right? You're hearing like that exactly or precisely? Oh, for sure, for sure. Oh, that's spot on. No, oh, that's spot on. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. I would say that's right, and exactly would be the most common one. Like especially exactly for me, I tend to hear exactly rather than that's right. Maybe it has to do with the the carrier of the language and how you know who am I speaking with. But exactly is uh, it it speaks to the same thing. That's right, exactly. Right. I'll try. It, when someone is, I'll try. When someone's saying, I'll try, you could you could play with this. Like, are you um, are you looking for a way in or a way out? So it's it's kind of depending on on the situation. But yeah, I'll try to do this. People like Douglas you, and me and Eugenia, we uh, we're working on eliminating the word try. What's the Yoda? There is no try. There is do or don't. Do or do not. Do or do not. It's key. Just go. Uh, let's see. Influence those behind the table. Man, this is something that I feel like it's buried. And I feel like a lot of us bury this, this part. It's like we want to believe the person in front of us is the decision maker. And in reality... They probably got multiple voices in their head and outside their head. And so you want to aggregate all those different voices, bring them all together, get them all lined up. I noticed that, uh, I think I once dropped a client because I'm like, you know, even though your dad's not here with us, I know he's not going to like this, he's not going to like that. And you keep going after properties like that. Like, yeah, all the decision makers are a big factor. And it's best to identify them quickly, seclude them, boss them, smother them with listening, empathy, report. What do you guys think? I mean, you, you got to understand that if you're talking to a company, there are always, like you said, the voices behind and the voices in the head. And there's always going to be someone who might put the sticks in the wheels, right? So you gotta you gotta explore those things, and you you're showing a couple of things by doing that that you understand um, that you are considering the implications that you're considering other people who might be involved, and you're also guiding them through those decision making processes. So asking how does this affect the rest of your team, you know, and uh, you know what, what happens if um, you know if you, you you can't make this decision? What happens if there's someone who's not going to be on board with this. You exploring the implementation thing, uh, and, and that's that's important to do, tremendously important. And it shows a lot of things, especially that you are listening and you are concerned. So by doing that, you're establishing yourself as a um, trusted authority, someone that you know not only not only want things for themselves, but actually understanding that there is bigger implication. Um, that's going to happen, whether they're going to go with your solution or with any solution in this case. I don't know, Eugene. I got to talk to my wife first. Okay. And is this how you um, is this how you normally make decisions? No, not really. I typically just make it and because, you know, it's easier to 
ask for forgiveness and permission. Okay. And let's say your partner was here right now and she would be, uh, you know, hearing this and would be on board. Would, would that be still an answer for you? Oh, I have to explain things to her. I'd rather just do it now. I don't want to explain things. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, a, a lot of times uh, you find out that people are just putting others like as an obstacle. Like, haha, like, well, I, I got to talk to these people first and, and like, yeah, all right. And then they come back and they're like, oh, you know, we're still talking, blah. That becomes a person that just frustrates me. You know, I'm like, I, I would rather find someone else that's easier, fun and lucrative instead of dealing with someone that's, you know, that annoying and frustrating like, man, every time, even if I ask you if you want want water or Sprite, oh, well, let, let me go talk to somebody first, Nugget. I can't. Like, it's just uh, it's an extreme, it's a limit, right? I'm also with you on that. I'm, I'm a high velocity when it comes to most things like that. And if they give me a bunch of stuff like that, I just pawn them. It's a, you know, it gets, gets back to the mud mentality. It's like there are so many opportunities on a given day, get daily basis that you just, I just can't see, you know, battling it out every day with someone. Yeah, like that. turn turn your cheek a few times. All right. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, get back to me. Okay. Hey, you know, that's enough. Yeah, that's it. What do you think, Freddie? You've been kind of quiet. Yes. Um, you got to talk to your wife first before you talk or something. <laughs> no, it, it came to my mind. Uh, I think Gene Cam, he says, do not assume you're you adverse uh, adversary uh, decision process sometimes is more difficult than you might think. And he mentioned to to ask question uh, who is who who's the decision maker or how decision are make in in a specific situation. Sometimes people don't know who exactly is the one who's gonna give the last approval. And that's true with my kids, because when someone wants something, the last one to decide is my kids, not my wife or me. I think it's me, but it's not me. Does it make sense? Sure, it makes well, sense. I think Eugene made sense of it. Did it make sense, Eugene? So, Freddie, when you're saying when you're saying there is a decision to be made, you are the last one to make a decision, or you think that you you're making decision, but in fact, it, it's not. So, yeah, so. Sometimes we think we know who makes the decision. Like I should make the decision. I'm the father, right? But um, sometimes some decisions are more complicated than you might think. So people assume. Um, so I was, I was um, in the park with my daughters and I didn't want to get something, but I knew that, you know, the decision was from my, from my daughter, not from, not from my wife or me. So the guy, he was smart and kind of asked the kids what they wanted. So he said something like, uh, so, who is the one who's going to buy uh, ice cream? So my daughter, they say me, me. So I was sold in that idea. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, in this case, yeah, I'm not sure. It, it feels like you're being forced into making a decision because now there is this pressure on you to whether you're gonna buy ice cream and you know that it, you, you know you don't want to buy ice cream because whatever issues, health issues or you know, spoil it, you don't want to spoil them. And at the same time, you know that if you not buy ice cream, that might undermine your relationship or mood in the moment. And you know, you're gonna have to fight this thing. So you're choosing between these two, between these two things. Um, is that sure? Yeah, what I yeah. was trying to say, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not 
for not being clear, but what, what I'm trying to say under these three questions, sometimes it's very important to, to ask who is the decision maker in certain ways or, or what's, how that decisions are made. Um, so you're saying as, that the ice cream as, man- That's a how question. The yeah. ice cream man is really smart. He knows that the real decision maker is the kid. And same thing with cereal commercials. Why do you think they advertise to kids? Because they know when the adults at the cereal store, the kid's going to point to that one he saw in the commercial and say, that's the one I want. Yeah, what are you going to debate with the kid? No. Uh, yeah, you think you're in charge, but yeah, they might be in charge in that moment. Same thing with the ice cream. Yeah, the kid was the one in charge. Because if you say no, what are they going to do? They're going to start crying and throw a tantrum and it doesn't sound like you can handle that freddy sounds like you'll be guilt tripped yeah oh man i know i'm gonna find myself there myself in a couple of years in that situation but i think i'm right letting the kid cry i'm because you no know, it's it's their way of connecting with god when you cry you have a direct bridge with god <laughs> so every, every time Where's I mean, this coming from? <laughs> this is true. Every time I make anybody cry or I see them cry, I, I tell them, you know what? I am really jealous right now. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, because you're talking directly to God. You have a connection right now. Ask him some stuff for me, will you? And then they stop crying. And I'm like, what? You don't. Why are you, why are you still crying for? It was, it was enjoyable. Yeah, Freddie, let the kid cry. Let them talk with God, will you? He's so selfish, man. You're talking to God right now. Pattern interrupt. That's fantastic. Isn't it? But, you know, it's <laughs> it's really true, though. It really is. I, you know, it helps me with not getting guilt trip ever. I never get guilt trip. I'm just, you know, look at you cry. Oh, lucky. <laughs> so jealous. <laughs> Bloody savage. Ah, uh, feels me with joy. Feels me with joy. <laughs> Good job, ice cream truck driver. Hey, I bet you like making kids cry all day, right? What? No, man. Uh, Freddie, is what you need uh, to do, man. You got to lift up your skirt, grab your balls, and tell that ice cream man, stop making my kids cry. I wouldn't mind. But be like, hey, look, honey, uh, ice cream truck's coming again. Uh, I don't want to. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let's go to this. Speaking of crying, uh, seven thirty-eight fifty-five. Man, body language is very influential. And face, tone of voice, seven percent content. I always mix. I used to mix these up right here. The voice. And the body language. I swear to you, I, I thought voice was higher than body language because, you know, these FBI guys, they do all the work with their voice over the phone. And so I like what they say, like, man, learn some body language skills. Like, you know, if you can destroy just with tone of voice, imagine what you can do with the body language. You know, one thing I've worked on you know, I, I video myself randomly. I'll put the camera there. I'll hit record and I'll watch it later. And I notice uh, I'll do, I do, I used to do this a lot. Call me shifty eyes. Shifting my eyes everywhere. And now um, I get a special power and I told my, my wife knows. She's like, wow, you're really good at making eye contact. I'm like, yeah, I'll tell you my secret. I, I'm looking right, right in the middle of your forehead. You don't ever look in people's eyes. Just what they think you are. And that's what matters, right? Perception. Yeah. Uh, body language. Are there other are joints and elbows pointing towards you? Or is half of them pointing elsewhere, like at the door? Yeah, they probably want to run away. Probably want to leave. Do you guys get any uh, body language tips and tricks? I'm just going to plug uh, Chase Hughes' six-minute x-ray right now. It's a work I'm 
currently trying to unpack the just the incredible amounts of detail that he, he really dives deep in on. Blink rate is one of the big ones he talks about. Um, somebody's blinking a lot, you know, indicates stress, for example. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. He, I mean, he really deep, deep dives on what, like, uh, like open palms, for example, is a way to project openness and open body language. So if you like, you have your palms like that, then you're you're open to the suggestions. And then, of course, you've talked to someone like that, right? It's like skeptical or defensive. Even literally, if you if you like, if you see their they're pointing down like that they're protecting their jugular literally so that's really incredible what you can the information someone can just and you can't and you can't really it's really hard physiology physiology wise to to yeah to lie yeah. so you the body will tell the truth even if the words might not be congruent so it's if you can learn it i think there might be some next level stuff available to it to us from that standpoint I love it. Just YouTube body language. There's body language experts like Joe Navarro. Yep. And man, I love how they break down body language. Uh, obviously, the biggest thing in body language is the micro flinches. Mm. If someone's nose flinch or something. I've caught it in mocks, and it's always the turnaround point after that micro mm. flinch. Let's see. Fly great distances to meet people in person. This is why uh, Douglas and I are working on getting a private jet. Oh. Uh, let's see. Pay close attention to tone and body language. See if they don't match up with literal meaning of words. And I'll tell you the master of it is Art Kelly. Your mind's telling me no, but your body, your body's telling me yes. Think about that. Art Kelly notices that the woman is telling him, no, 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 R. Kelly, I don't, I don't want you. But R. Kelly knows that their mind is telling them, yes, yes, R. Kelly, I want you. My body's saying no. Incongruency. That's what you're noticing. Yeah. So there is discomfort. And that's, that comes down to lies. I mean, everyone's trying to you know, understand and that I have deeper idea, lying to me, I may not lying to me. This is a gut feeling that you get. There is some sort of incongruency between what they say and how they are. And so it's your job to probe deeper into that. Labels are fantastic to do that. And you gotta observe it. You gotta bring it to the conscious level and see their reaction. I'll tell you the- And by doing that- The most noticeable one, yeah, you said observe, their reaction, what they're saying is uh, Joe Navarro broke down Bill Clinton when he's saying, I did not have sexual relations with that lady. Uh, he was nodding his head opposite to what he was saying. Uh, so I've caught people where they're like, they're like, they're like, no, Dan, I'm telling you the truth. And it's like, they're nodding no. Yeah. Yeah, those incongruencies. Uh, the body's not good at handling them. So you got to be able to identify it. It's like going against your nature. You're trying to fake the reality. And the more you try to fake it, the, the harder it is to, to sustain it. Because now you have to retain some pieces of information to stay congruent. And that takes massive amount of efforts. It's much easier to convey the truth from the from different perspective, perhaps, rather than rather than outright lying. Yeah, let's see. Because because it's you'll just get a, caught in your web of lies. Like literally, you, you get eventually. caught in the web on the web of lies. You know, that's why uh, it's more fun to go with the truth, and it's it's also more funny because uh, they say the truth is is harder than. Sometimes the truth is like more far fetched than a lie. Yeah, like uh, why lie when the truth is is bad enough as it is. And again, if you if you think that the truth will have some sort of a negative impact, use accusation on it, prepare them, create the cushion for them to fall back on when you 
deliver the truth. And then let's go to second, the last bullet point on that. Oh yeah, you just said use labels to discover source of incongruence. Yeah. I heard you say yes, but it seemed like there was hesitation in your voice. No, this is important. Let's make sure we get this right. Yeah, they say like, um, especially if you got somebody that's, I, I don't want to say, I want to call them a sheep. It was in some sales thing where like, you'll have clients that are like sheeps. You can get them to agree to whatever and they'll do it. They'll follow. But man, if they find out you let them to the wrong path or at the wrong place, they are going to retaliate. And so, yeah, that's why it's important. Like, hey, are you just saying that because you feel pressure? Yeah. Any thoughts on that, Freddie? <laughs> no, no, like the... But just in general, 7% content, 38% tone, 55% body language and everything in there. Are you working on anything? I feel tone of voice is uh, well. It depends what you do, of course. But I think tone of voice is it, it, in practice at least more important for me. Yeah, same here. That's why I thought tone was more higher percentage than body and face. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, I, I don't mind flying in my private jet to meet people in person. Not only that, but, you know, the butterflies are more real, probably, when you're in proximity to someone. You can really get a gut feel. And let's go on to the last portion here. Uh, this is something Freddie and I were talking about. I was telling them that Black Swan's looking to get rid of this. Uh, they're finding out it's an agitating the counterpart, and it's true. Uh, in the mock, somebody did the rule of three on me. And I'm like, after the second one, I'm like, hey, man, like, I literally said yes, like, two times. Like, what, what's, what the fuck is going, what's going on, man? And the guy's like, oh, I'm just doing the rule of three. And I'm like, what? That's what it, that's what it feels like? That's what the rule, I'm like, that don't feel right. Uh, so, yeah, they're saying two times is plentiful. No need for a third. So rule of three, get them to say yes three times. One, get them to give me a commitment. Number two, label plus summarize, get it, that's right. And then number three, calibrate it, how or what questions about implementation. That's what will constitute success. What do we do if we get off track? So the three ways of saying yes. Um, yeah, two of those is good enough, honestly. And I was going to ask, what do you think the difference? I, I know I, I've had similar experience with, with as an assertive, it, it, it does tend to piss me off if somebody stays too long in this. Uh, I'd be curious what your thoughts are with accommodators to kind of pin them down a little bit, if, if maybe it might still be good. Yeah, that's what they said. Like this, if anything, really applies to accommodators. Yeah, assertives. I mean, with number one, get them to give me a commitment. You get a commitment from an assertive, bro. It's done. It's going to get done. It might take a bit. It might be under a turn, but it's going to get done. Uh, nothing wrong with a a sum, a, you know, a summary to get it that. You should always get it that's right out of your counterpart. So I feel number two, it's already baked into your negotiation. And I feel number one, is baked in, especially if it's an assertive or even analytical, those two. And yeah, when you get the accommodator, I think that's the only time where you should, uh, you know, ask, uh, hey, how is it going to look like? What's the process going to be like? Uh, what happens if you get off track? Yeah, that one. Yeah, save that, save that stuff for an accommodator like Eugene. I think for for the yes three times, it's like 
you have to explore the success. What's going to happen if we, uh, you know, how do we know we're successful in this? But then you have to explore the failure too. You know, have you, um, have you considered what's going to happen if we, you know, fail at this? Like, if we keep doing the same thing all over again, let them, let them, let them answer this. Oh, yeah, we, we can always get back to the, the way things are. Well, are you willing, are you willing to settle for this? So that, that way you're getting an understanding how, what is the decision-making process, how committed they are. So you have to probe and clarify deeper. And, you know, yes, three times, you know, you, you, can, you can get yes three times, but also like you have to realize what's behind those yeses. Like, can you future pace them? Like, what, what would the ideal solution look like? You know, how, what kind of, you know, how, how, how would the company life job would be different if we were to implement the solution? What would that do for you personally? So you, you got to kind of probe and clarify a bit deeper and not necessarily hear it yes three times, but understand what's behind those yeses and understand not only the success, but the failure component to, 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 the, to the commitment. Oh, all right, guys, it's 11 p.m. Damn. I'm tired. I hope you see some of you guys in the morning. Oh, there's that sound. Question. I, I just read in uh, one of the documents that Daniel shared about, about the label acts. So, what would be your take on calibrate question and label ask when when do you choose one over the other oh yeah man um assertives they're a special special type with the assertive you want to do asking labels maybe uh well not maybe do one like really really strong calibrated question and the rest asking labels yeah they found out that assertives when you ask them how am I supposed to do this or do that? They'll just flat out tell you, well, fig figure it out. Go figure it out. What are you asking me for? Go figure it out. That's what I pay you for. And so an asking label would be much more effective because it requires you to do some thinking. Assertive just really wants to execute. Doesn't really want to think much. A lot of them will tell you, man, just, just give me three options. And so, yeah, give them three options, two very unfavorable and one very favorable for you. It should be obvious for them. Does that help, Freddie? Yes, thank you. Do you know what negotiator you are? Moderator, most likely. Accommodator? Yes. Oh, yeah, then you got advantage over other negotiators. <laughs> But no, with my kids, with my kids, I'm more assertive. Well, you would have, uh, you should really practice with them being what you are, an accommodator. And I mean, as Douglas and I are always trying to be more accommodating. Uh, it's not easy for us, but that's, that's the ultimate negotiator. He accommodates you by listening to you, by helping you, accommodates by listening for you solving your own problems. And then, yeah, essentially they got to jump into more of an uh, assertive, like that can be the problem for an accommodator is maybe they're too accommodating. You got to have a little mix in there. But I mean, I guess that's good. You're practicing assertiveness. That's good. But yeah, no, you definitely, uh, definitely have an advantage over many people. It, is that why you mute your mic every time? Accommodating. You you asked me. Yeah, I asked you a terrible why question. I'm sorry, I didn't get that question. You said, do you keep muting your mic because you're an accommodator? No, because I have a noise uh, here. Oh, we don't hear anything. Oh, okay. Just teasing. Okay, Trying to trigger you, man. <laughs> <laughs>
that's all I want. That's all I want. That's all I want to do. <laughs> Even at 11 p.m. Well, midnight for you. Yes. This was good. All right, gentlemen. Got to jump off. Yeah. Here. So next time we're going to go to page four. There's a page lot on back there. Page four is yeah. dick. Wow. Yeah, types of accommodators. When you get into that. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. Thank All right, you gentlemen. Guys. Thank Sounds you for good. coming. See you guys. See you on the next one.